Okay, so now that we've talked about the, the final structure of our pre-mRNA strand, we have to talk about the process of RNA splicing. And RNA splicing is a process by which we get rid of uh, the parts of the pre-mRNA that we're actually not going to translate. So what you see here is, is a picture of, of what we've talked about so far. And this is the pre-mRNA strand with the 5' prime cap, the UTRs, the start codons, the stop codons, um, the 3' prime UTR, and polyatin, all that stuff. What we're talking about now is this, this protein encoding segment right in here. Right, this is the piece here that we are going to look at when we actually undergo translation. This part here, the, the 5' prime UTR and the 3' prime UTR will be there, but we're not going to translate those. It's going to be from the start codon to the stop codon, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, the process of translation. Generally, these protein encoding segments can be up to 8,000 nucleotides long, um, and we don't need all 8,000 of those nucleotides. Generally, um, you use about 1,200 nucleotides um, to create your sequence of amino acids. So 1,200 nucleotides gets you to about 400 amino acids, and, and that's just an average. So what we have in this region is, is some of the stuff that we're actually going to translate and some of the stuff that we're not. And the stuff that we're not going to translate, we don't want to, that to leave the nucleus because uh, it would just be confusing in the process of translation to have that additional stuff in there. Um, so what we do have is um, segments of this protein encoding segment that are called introns and segments that are called exons. So if you look at this the second image here, we see this DNA, and in this DNA you have your introns and your exons. The introns are the non-coding segments of the DNA, and then, again, the non-coding segments of the RNA. The exons are the ones that are coded. They're going to be coded for in the process of translation. So what we talk about with RNA splicing, it's basically a cut-and-paste step where we're going to remove all of these introns, and then we're going to paste back together the exons. Uh, so we're just going to splice out these pieces here, piece here, the piece here, and the piece here, and just glue all these pieces back together. And this final piece here is no longer a piece of pre-mRNA. It's now the mRNA that we're going to use. That's the piece that we're going to do. It's going to leave the nucleus and will be translated by the ribosome. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how the process of mRNA splicing uh, actually takes place. So we're going to introduce... Um, some new enzymes and new, some new pieces of RNA um, that we're going to use in order for this process to take place. So we have, again, our, our strand of pre-mRNA. And you see here in blue, this is the intron. All right, so this is the piece that is going to stay in the nucleus. The intron piece is the, is the part that's not coded, so it's going to stay inside the nucleus, intron inside the nucleus. Um, and our two outer regions are the exons. Exons, those are the ones that are going to exit the nucleus. They're the ones that are going to be expressed in the form of a protein a little bit later on. So we're going to cut out in this process this middle region right here, which is our intron. Okay. Now, this monster-looking thing is called a spliceosome. The spliceosome is a, a collection of, of RNA and proteins that are actually going to do the splicing. And what you don't see here is that this, this spliceosome... Um, is made up of a bunch of individual things called SNRPs, S-N-R-N-Ps. And SNRPs, which stands for small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, and you don't need to know that. You just need to know the SNRPs. Um, the SNRPs actually recognize um, the splicing sites, the, the regions between your intron and your exon. So the SNRPs make up the spliceosome, and this spliceosome is what's going to actually perform the function of, of separating uh, the introns from your exons. So we have our RNA strand, we have, again, our introns, our first exon, that region there is, is our first splice site that the SNRPs will identify, that region there is the second splice site that our region will identify, uh, don't worry about the pyrich regions, um, and then that our exons. Okay, so our uh, spliceosome is going to come along and attach onto our first splice site. And you're actually going to create the um, spliceosome in this process. It's bent over, attach onto the second site, and now we're going to create our spliceosome um, with our SNRPs and tail. And the spliceosomes are going to go in there, 
they will actually cut out or splice out the uh, intron, which is, you'll see in a second, a little snipping action here. All right, we don't really need to know chemically what's going on here, just overall the splicing out of, of the introns by the spliceosome and the snurps. Um, and you get that piece kind of snipped off. All right, and again, we're, we're, this whole process requires ATP. It snips off that second piece. And what we get in the end, what we get in the end is our strand of mRNA. And all that's left and that mRNA now are the exons. Um, and you notice this yellow piece down here that, that, that wasn't labeled as an intron or an exon. Uh, that's the poly A tail, which we talked about in the, the mRNA processing video. So that's it. That's your mRNA now that's going to leave the nucleus and head out into the cytoplasm to attach onto a ribosome. Okay, so the last thing that we'll talk about is the an idea called alter, alternative RNA splicing. And, and alternative RNA splicing comes from this idea that um, if you think to what we've talked about so far, just going from DNA to mRNA, and then we know eventually we're going to go from mRNA to a protein, it would make sense to think that one gene is going to produce one mRNA, which is going to, which is going to be spliced one specific way, and then what you get left, that, that mRNA strand, is going to go out to the ribosome and make one um, specific protein. So this idea of a one gene, one protein idea makes a lot of sense in the context of what we've talked about so far. But what we know is that, that some genes don't have that one gene, one protein relationship. You can get many, many different types of proteins from a single gene, and that just depends upon, the proteins that, you, that you're going to produce, just depends upon uh, which parts of that the protein encoding segment is actually identified as an exon, which is which other parts identified as an intron. Exons, exons aren't always um, static things. You can change exons in some genes. And what we have here is an example of fruit flies. So we have our mRNA strand, and, and the one on the left here, uh, the red being the um, the exon that's released, the blue again, that's the cap and the poly -A tail, cap and poly -A tail. In the male fruit fly, this red part is the exon, whereas in the female fruit fly, this green part is the exon. And that's what differentiates a male fruit fly from a female fruit fly. This male fruit fly identified this red segment as an exon and everything else as an intron. Whereas the female recognized the green as the exon and everything else as an intron. So this alternative RNA splicing allowed us to get two, allowed us to produce two different proteins from the same gene. That idea of alternative RNA splicing uh, pulls us away from that one gene, one protein idea. And that's it. That's all of RNA splicing.